It's an excerpt from The Terrorist Son. I've spent my life trying to understand what drew my father to terrorism and struggled with the knowledge that I have his blood in my veins. By telling my story, my intention is to do something hopeful and instructive. To offer a portrait of a young man who was raised in the fires of fanaticism and embraced nonviolence instead. I can't make any grand claims for myself, but all our lives have themes, and the theme of mine so far is this. Everyone has a choice. Even if you're trained to hate, you can choose tolerance. You can choose empathy." End quote. For any individual, the proximity to hate-filled rhetoric and violence would predetermine a narrative that would be difficult, if not impossible, to change. Revolutions can incite fear and intimidation or come from love and compassion. When any son's first hero in life, his father, personifies division and hate, how can that son change the narrative and seek love and peace? Is there any hope for him? Is there any hope for the rest of us? Richard Blanco spoke of home this morning and where we belong. Perhaps just as important is the question, to whom do we belong? The natural response to that question could be one's family. We belong to our family and our family to us. To reject one's family is not simply an act of rejecting someone else. It's a rejection of oneself, one's heart and soul and body. All of who I am is made up of those who gave birth to me and raised me. I am my family. Zach Ibrahim was surrounded by terrorism and raised in an environment that preached hatred towards the other. It would have been natural, perhaps even understandable, if not acceptable, for him to follow in his father's footsteps. But Zach escaped his father's legacy and chose peace and nonviolence. He became the change. He most wish to see in this world. In The Terrorist Son, Zach writes, I am convinced that empathy is more powerful than hate and that our lives should be dedicated to making it go viral." End quote. Zach's story and message gives me hope that revolutions such as ours here and revolutionaries such as you can eradicate the empathy gap. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to a messenger of peace and hope, Zach Ibrahim. Good evening. I'm here today to share some stories from my life in the hopes of illustrating that no matter what path you're put on, you can choose to promote peace. Before I begin, I feel the need to explain that my story is in no way a description of the vast majority of Muslim family life, both here in America and abroad. In fact, when people take the time to interact with one another, it doesn't take long to realize that for the most part, we all want the same things out of life. A job with a decent wage, a safe environment to educate our children, and to live in a community that doesn't chastise us for our beliefs. However, in every religion, in every population, you'll find a small group of people who hold so fervently to their beliefs that they feel they must use any means necessary to make others live as they do. Being raised in the home of a Muslim zealot, I have been exposed to many of the things that people fear about Islam yet I stand here promoting peace. This would be impossible in a world where we hang on to our old prejudices. I'm here to dispel the stereotypes that some media pundits and politicians attempt to project into mainstream society. 
feel that I can use my experience to combat those willing to go to such brutal lengths for their beliefs. From the political opportunists who use the more radical elements of Islam to generalize the beliefs of all Muslims, but also because of extremist groups themselves who believe that the lives of innocent people are fair game on the ideological battlefield, I am compelled to speak up. Now, it's a foolish mistake to believe that religious extremism is exclusive to Islam. Unfortunately, there are endless examples in every belief system of religiously motivated violence. But as a society that values the individual freedoms afforded to us, it is un-American to ostracize entire communities for the actions of the fear. When we ostracize the innocent, it tears apart the fabric of our society, which only works to foment the next generation of intolerance. It may come as a surprise to some that although I was raised in the religion of Islam, I am no longer a Muslim. That has little to do with my feelings on the religion itself, and in fact, I only bring it up to point out that I'm not here advocating for any particular belief. I'm simply here to share my stories and the lessons that I learned from them. But having said that, I would like to illustrate the path that I was put on as a child by my father, who for most of my life has resided in maximum security prisons. This was a special Friday for me. I was a normal six-year-old staring at the chalkboard waiting for the three o'clock bell to ring so that I could escape from school. <laughs> but that day my father was waiting in the hallway early. He said, Salaamu Alaikum, which means peace be upon you. And I replied, Wa Alaikum Salaam, and peace be upon you. The proper way for two Muslims to greet one another. He tells me that we are going to the mosque for a Friday prayer where the blind Sheikh Omar Abdurrahman was to preach. You see, at midday every Friday, millions of Muslims around the world gather into mosques to listen to sermons given by Sheikhs. The Quran, the sacred text of Islam, says that praying in a group brings you more blessings than praying alone, making Friday prayer the most blessed prayer of the week. <coughs> Most clerics preach harmony between Muslims and non-Muslims, believing that there is a place in this world for all of its inhabitants to live in coexistence. The blind sheikh was not one of those men. He sat at the front of the worshippers with a microphone attached to his collar, and he began his sermon. And I tried my best to mimic my father as he listened intently to the sheikh's words. <laughs> That day, the sheikh argued that Western culture was corrupting Muslims all over the planet, that the consequences of Western democracy were materialism, sexual perversion, and idolatry meant to distract the true believers from the word of God, laying the blame for the Muslim world's ills on many of the same groups that men like Jerry Falwell blamed for 9-11, pagans, feminists, and gays. But the sheikh saved his most venomous words for that of the nation of Israel. He spoke of interference and collusion by the United States and its Western allies to further their agenda at the expense of Muslim nations. And he used that support to foment the emotions of his congregation. When the sheikh finished his sermon, my father took my hand and he led me toward the front. This wasn't the first time that I had met the sheikh. In fact, I had spent more than a few nights either at the mosque or at one of my father's friend's houses, or even in our living room, sitting on the floor, listening to the men discuss religion and politics. I realized it was always somewhat ominous exchanging words with the sheikh after one of his sermons. And looking back, it was quite clear that he was wrapped with the passion and anger that he conveyed in his speech. On the drive home that afternoon, I, I wondered to myself what made my father and the sheikh and, and the other men so devout. And I asked my father, when did you become such a good Muslim? And he said, when I came to America and saw everything that was wrong with it. And in that instant, I saw the same look on his face that I had seen earlier on the sheikh's. Our family dynamic began to change soon after. It was during that time, at the height of the Afghan war, that I was forced to say goodbye to one of my best friends. 
his stepfather took he and his siblings from their home in New Jersey to Pakistan to train and eventually fight in Afghanistan. He was 10 years old at the time. <clears throat> because of his inexperience, he was used to lob grenades at the enemy's occupying forces. And when he'd returned to America less than a year later, where once there stood a happy, vibrant child, now stood a solemn veteran of the Afghan war. He was a shadow of his former self. His innocence taken from him by a war he had no business being a part of. This is what happens when we use violence as a resolution of conflict. In a back and forth effort to gain even the slightest strategic advantage against one's enemies, man has gone to lengths that seem inconceivable to those who are sheltered from the negative effects of war. But make no mistake, humanity has shown that it's willing to exploit almost any resource, even the lives of children, all in the name of one ideology or another. The summer after I turned seven, my grandfather came to visit our family from Egypt. Little did he know, my father had brought him here to try and convince him to take my family back to Egypt so that my father could go fight in the Afghan war. You see, at the time, the United States was secretly funding the Mujahideen, the Muslim men and sometimes children, who were going to Afghanistan from all over the world to fight. My grandfather's response was, absolutely not. Your family is your responsibility. If you want to make jihad, stay here and take care of them. Now let's take that word jihad, for example. If you were to ask the average person, what do you think jihad means? They may say that it's an act of terrorism, or that it means holy war. But that is not the definition of jihad. In reality, jihad can be something as simple as providing for your family. It's only the extremists and those who wish to generalize that reduce the word to a destructive act. And in fact, the Prophet Muhammad specifically refers to jihad that precludes violence as the greater jihad. My grandfather went back home thinking that he had won the argument, but my father was left only frustrated and unwilling to find a non-violent outlet for those frustrations. On November 5th, 1990, when I was seven years old, my father assassinated a man. That man was Rabbi Meir Kahana, the leader of the Jewish Defense League. The JDL, as it was called, was described by the federal government as the largest terrorist organization operating inside the United States at the time. And in fact, many people justified my father's actions by saying that this was the work of one extremist killing another. While attempting to flee the scene, my father was also shot by a federal postal officer, and he and Meyer Kahana were rushed to the hospital with similar gunshot wounds to the neck. Kahana died at Bellevue Hospital that night. My father lived. Although initially acquitted of the murder while serving time on assault and weapons charges, he began planning attacks on a dozen New York City landmarks, including tunnels, synagogues, and United Nations headquarters. Thankfully, those plans were foiled by an FBI informant. Sadly, the 1993 bombing of World Trade Center was not. My father, al Sayed Nasser, would eventually be convicted for his involvement in the plot. A few months prior to his arrest, my father sat me down and explained that for the past few weekends, he and some friends had been going to a shooting range for target practice. He told me I'd be going with him to the next. Uh, excuse me, he told me I would be going with him the next morning. And to be honest, I was so excited I could barely sleep that night. We arrived at the shooting range on Long Island, which unbeknownst to our group was being watched by the FBI. My father and I walked toward a group of men huddled by the trunk of a car, and inside were a range of weapons. When it was my turn to shoot, my father helped me hold a rifle to my shoulder and explained how to aim at a target about 30 yards off. <clears throat> that day, the last bullet I shot hit the small orange light that sat on top of the target, and to everyone's surprise, especially mine, 
the light exploded. And as I stood there not being sure if I was in trouble or not, my uncle turned to the other men and in Arabic said, Ibn Abu, like father, like son. And they all seemed to get a really big laugh out of that comment, but it wasn't until a few years later that I fully understood what they thought was so funny. They thought they saw in me the same destruction my father was capable of. Those men would eventually be convicted of placing a van filled with 1,500 pounds of explosives into the sub-level parking lot of the World Trade Center's North Tower, causing an explosion that killed six people and injured over a thousand others. These were the men I looked up to. These were the men I called Amor, which means uncle. It saddens me to think that had they not committed this crime, that the innocent people killed in the attack would be at home, spending time with their loved ones. Instead, their families are forced to live their lives without their guidance and companionship. My father went to prison when I was seven years old, and there's not a day that goes by that I don't wish he had chosen a peaceful life with his family. Instead, he exposed me from a very young age to the intolerance and radical nature of extremism. And yet I stand before you all today with this simple message, <coughs> that no matter the level of violence you've been exposed to, it doesn't have to define your character. That in all of us is the ability to change our paths. It's certainly unusual when an American citizen admits to being the son of the first member of a Bin Laden organization to shed blood on American soil. Shame for what my father had done and fear for how I would be judged for his actions had caused me to hide my identity from most of those who knew me. I realized at a young age I had to be careful who I told my life story to. People's reactions have ranged from nervous laughter and shock to outright anger and threats against my life. I even once sustained a defensive wound across my hand as I tried grabbing a knife from someone I thought was a friend as he lunged at me exclaiming, I'd be doing this country a service if I killed you. Mm. Luckily, I was able to escape without any serious injury. By the time I turned 19, I had already moved 20 times in my life. And that instability during my childhood didn't really provide an opportunity to make many friends. Each time I'd meet one or two people, I began to feel comfortable around. It was time to pack up and move to the next town. And being a perpetual new kid at school, I was frequently the target of bullies. So for the most part, I spent my time at home reading books and watching TV or playing video games. For those reasons, my social skills were lacking to say the least. And growing up in a bigoted household, I wasn't prepared for the real world. I'd been raised to judge people based on arbitrary measurements like a person's race or religion. So what opened my eyes? One of the major turning points in my life came when I found, or I'm sorry, came when I was able through a college prep program to take part in the National Youth Convention in Philadelphia during the 2000 presidential elections. This organization brought young people from all over the country together to talk about issues that affect the youth. And having been bullied for much of my life, uh, I joined a group talking about youth violence. A few days into the conference, I found out that one of the kids that I had become particularly close with was Jewish. Now, I had never had a Jewish friend before. And to be honest, my first reaction was actually a sense of pride because I thought I'd done something that nobody had ever done before. But I realized that there was no natural animosity between the two of us. And it was the first time in my life that I thought perhaps what I'd been taught wasn't true. A few years later, I got a summer job at Busch Gardens, an amusement park in Florida. And there I was exposed to people from all sorts of faiths and cultures, and it proved to be fundamental to the development of my character. 
For much of my life, I've been taught that being gay was a sin, and by extension, that all gay people were evil. And not only were they evil, but they were actively trying to make me evil as well. As chance would have it, I had the opportunity to interact with some of the gay dancers at a show there. And I soon found that many were the kindest, least judgmental people that I had ever met. And certainly when they had no reason to be toward me, when it was clear that I judged them for what was called their lifestyle. I didn't know it when I was going through it, but being bullied created a great sense of empathy in me toward the suffering of others. I mean, it comes very unnaturally to me to treat people who are kind in any other way than how I would want to be treated. I don't know what it's like to be gay, but I'm well acquainted with being judged for things that are beyond my control. One day, not long after that, I had a conversation with my mother about how my worldview was starting to change, and she said something to me that I will hold dear to my heart for as long as I live. She looked at me with the weary eyes of someone who had experienced enough dogmatism to last a lifetime and said, I'm tired of hating people. And it sounds like such a simple response, but for me it was so profound that I often fight back tears just thinking about it. It wasn't just that you could see the, the toll that dealing with the fallout of my father's actions for all of those years had on her, dealing with the death threats and the lawyers, the FBI, the media. It was like she was giving me permission to go out into the world and experience it unencumbered by the prejudices I'd been taught. That experience served to me as a reminder that we must work together in order to achieve our goals. Remember that extremism thrives on the fringes of society when we divide people into smaller and smaller groups based on one arbitrary distinction or another. We create communities ingrained with hostility toward one another. In these times of increased religious prejudice, I feel sharing my story helps to bring greater context to the debate over religious intolerance. People can become frustrated when they think one side cannot or will not understand their point of view. That's one of the reasons that I promote interfaith dialogue, because I feel that it's one of the most useful tools for encouraging solidarity within our community. And when I say dialogue, I don't mean that we pile everyone into a room to debate who's right and who's wrong. All I'm talking about is simple interaction, sharing a meal together, or working together on a community project. It not only aids in dispelling false stereotypes and prejudices, it helps to create stronger, safer communities. I really encourage everyone here to look into the different ways to foster that conversation in your schools and in your community. For a time, I chose not to come out with my story because I was ashamed for what my father had done. But today, most times that you hear about Islam or the Middle East in the news, it's usually related to some form of extremist behavior. And I knew that I could use my story to combat those negative stereotypes. If I could show people that although I had been subjected to this radical, intolerant ideology, that I did not become fanaticized. That if I could choose to promote peace, then anyone can. Wherever I speak, the subject inevitably turns to groups like ISIS and what we can do as individuals to combat those willing to go to such brutal lengths for their beliefs. And there are a lot of complicated answers to this question. There is no one path that a person takes to extremism. But the easiest and the simplest answer that I can give you is to say, don't give in to fear. Do not allow the actions of a radical group to alter our society in a way that further alienates nonviolent citizens marginalized by a fearful majority. Groups like ISIS traffic in fear and vengeance. They use these emotions to fill their ranks. Religion is used simply to cloak the intentions of men like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS. But it is those human emotions, anger, fear, 
the isolation that binds the rank and file. You cannot bomb people into a democracy. If anything, our attempts in places like Iraq have catastrophically backfired. Now, speaking publicly, uh, if anyone ever wants to get in contact with me, I'm, I'm never more than a few clicks away. And one morning I woke up to find an email from the Bureau of Prisons saying that my father would like to begin communication with me. It had been more than 10 years since we last spoke, and the email said I had 10 days to decide yes or no to the communication. Now the truth is, before I ever started speaking publicly, I had wanted to get back in contact with my father. I wanted to ask him why he chose the path he did. Was it for his faith, fame? Did he feel some overwhelming need to be a part of something greater than himself? If so, why wasn't his family enough? I wasn't sure if I was ready to hear the answers to these questions, but every part of me felt like I had to know. I thought, what if he died in prison and I never got this opportunity again? I would ask, what would you do if you were me? I clicked yes. I told my father about life after he went to prison, about being poor, moving from ghetto to ghetto, being bullied, and the anxiety that manifested from those experiences. It was important to me that he understand how hard it was for my family after he left, particularly how hard it was for my mother. I told him that I was no longer a Muslim. But I like to make it a point to say that I didn't leave the religion because of my father's actions. I knew that what he did was well outside of mainstream Islam. I, I simply lost my faith. After that, his emails took on a different tone. All those questions that I had pondered for much of my life, he summed up by saying that it was simply God's plan which is not something that an atheist wants to hear. <laughs> and our conversation eventually became unhealthy, and so I ended communication again. And for the next few months, I'll be honest, I was really depressed that night. I didn't know what to do with myself. I had thought about these questions for so much of my life, and not getting an answer from him felt like a part of me was missing. And I thought about it, and I thought about it. And one day, I actually, I woke up, and I felt as though part of a weight had been lifted from me. And I realized that, although not what I wanted to hear, he had actually given me the answers that I had been searching for. His ideology led to a narrow and oversimplified worldview, one in which a person's religion race, gender, sexuality, was all that was needed to determine that person's worth. And I realized that I no longer needed his answers. And in a sense, that set me free. I've been very fortunate in my life, and I've gotten to speak in front of some really incredible groups of people. I was asked once to speak in front of an organization called Tuesday's Children, which began as a support group for the victims of 9-11, or excuse me, for the families of victims of 9-11, and eventually grew into an organization that provided support for survivors of terrorist attacks or their family members all over the world. And I had never been so nervous to get up on a stage and speak in front of a group of people. I thought, what could I tell them to make them feel that this world is worth saving. And it took me about five minutes to realize that I was the one that needed to be taught a lesson because these young people between the ages of 12 and 24 who had experienced some of the worst things that humanity can do to each other refused to allow those experiences to affect the trajectory of their life in a negative way. And not only that, but they wanted to use that experience to make the world a better place, to make sure that this didn't have to happen to someone else. And I find that incredible. It's easy to read the headlines and to become dissuaded, especially now, 
we can do that. Or we can look to the resolve of these young people and the many others like them around the world who have been through terrible experiences and refused to be broken by them. As I mature, I realize that the only way I can overcome the challenges of my past, which at times has been crippling, is to help others understand that hatred only produces more hate. But belief in nonviolence at least provides an opportunity to heal. That those cycles of violence don't have to continue forever. I am not my father. And with that simple fact, I stand here as proof that those cycles of violence don't have to continue forever. And should we fulfill our obligation to live peacefully and to put in the work needed in order to obtain peace, however difficult it can sometimes be, that ultimately we will leave this earth a better place for the ones we love. Thank you very much.